greeting everyone. Uh, my name is Yoshi Kato from Tokyo Christian University, and I'll be uh, emceeing and, and chairing the first session. Um, and the first speaker, uh, there are two speakers, uh, Dr. Kuni Sakamoto and, and uh, Dr. Shin Higashi. And may I introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Kuni Sakamoto. He has uh, received a PhD from University of Tokyo in 2012 on uh, Julius Kaiser Scaliger. And then he is currently a research fellow at the Nijmegen, Nijmegen University in the Netherlands. And he's, a, he's, he's about to come up with a new, new work uh, based on his dissertation and in Scaliger. And his title of, of, of this, this, this talk is Scaliger against Renaissance naturalism. So please welcome Dr. Kunisak. Indeed, the topic of my talk is your intellect. As you well know, the doctrine of intellect has long been a focal problem in the history of philosophy, especially um, from the period when Aristotle's relevant texts led Avelis to put forward the very radical understanding about the human intellect, which then was to cause animated controversies in the 13th and 15th centuries in particular. The Aristotelian intellect, however, apparently ceased to be in strong contention after the middle of the 16th century, probably because the decline of Avelis' authority uh, made philosophers feel unnecessary to take his thesis seriously. Yet this doesn't mean that the debate over the intellect vanished completely. Indeed, the issue aroused yet another controversy right in the middle of the 16th century. In 1550, Girolamo Caldano, a professor of medicine at the University of Pavia, published a philosophical encyclopedia which is entitled De Subdivitate. This book soon provoked a very vicious critique from another Italian physician, Julius Caesar Scaliger, who published in 1557 the Exoterica Exeritationes as a refutation of almost every single remark you can find in this literature. Among many, among numerous conflicting points between these two physicians, the theory of intellect deserves special attention, as Scaliger devoted the longest chapter of his work to this problem. Why, then, did Scaliger find Cardano's theory of intellect so intolerable? To answer this question, I would you what follows, analyze how Scaliger located Cardano's theory in his own vision of the history of philosophy. The analysis, I hope, would tell us much not only about Scaliger himself, but also about what it was like to ask about the intellect in the middle of the 16th century. Any Renaissance debate about the intellect revolved around the problem of how to interpret Aristotle's on the soul. In Cardano Scaliger controversy, the fundamental text can be found in its book 3, chapter 4, which I quote in the passage number 1 with handout. We said that intellect is in a sense potentially whatever is intelligent, though actually it is nothing until it understands. For in the case of objects which involve no matter, 
what understands and what is understood are identical. Scalian argues that this passage of Aristotle has led Cardell to a very strange understanding about our intellect. Look at the passage number two, which Scalian cites from De Sibutita. The intellect is precisely the thing that is understood. For instance, when I understand the horse, my intellect is the form of the horse. Scalia ridicules this remark. He says, I quote, the intellect of Cardano is the form of the horse. Therefore, Cardano is the horse, <laughs> unquote. The second absurdity Scalia points out can be seen in the, in the passage number three. Here, you clearly confess that the intellect is not a substance at all, but something accidental. For before you understand, you have no intellect. But when you understand, the intellect comes from outside, and what did not exist before you, even if you yourself existed, appears in you. Scaligel thus dismisses Cardano's theory, but just ridiculing it is not enough for him because he has noticed that Cardano's doctrine has a pedigree reaching back to antiquity. Look at what Scalia says in the passage number four. Alexander of Aphrodisias says in the 12th book of the Metaphysics, the material forms are potentially intelligible, but they become intelligible by the work of the intellect which abstracts them from matter. Therefore, when these forms are understood, they become not only actually intelligible, but also an intellect itself. This is just as something actually sensible becomes the senses themselves when it is sensed. For I would say, the intellect which receives the form of a thing becomes actually an intellect. These words are nonsense, and the parent of your nonsense. Recall that the 12th book of the commentary on the metaphysics was actually not written by Alexander, though the passage in question represents his own ideas rather accurately. Without doubting its authenticity, Scalia asserts that this remark of Alexander is the origin of Cardano's doctrine. Alexander identified the intellect with the object with its intellection, and this identification resulted in the aforementioned two absurdities you can find in Cardano's philosophy. Scaliger's doxographical inquiry does not stop here. He further observes that Alexander's theory has stimulated Avelis to introduce another force and this time much more notorious doctrine into philosophy, namely the thesis of the unity of the intellect. Scaliger's reconstruction of Avelois' reasoning proceeds as follows. Let us look at the passage number five. Avelois said in many places, the intellect is things that are understood, therefore, if singular were perceived by the intellect, it would become something singular. Avelois thus inherited Alexander's identification theory. He then, he Avelois then, contends that the intellect cannot recognize singulars, since it cannot be singular. <coughs> Why can it not be singular? According to Avelis, an individual entity can understand only singulars. Since universals are recognized by us, our intellect cannot be singular. It must be universal. But at the same time, it is empirically obvious that we can also understand singulars. From these discussions, Avelis supposes two different actors that are responsible for our intellection. One receives universals, the other recognized singulars. 
The former is the universal intellect common to all human beings, while the latter is our individual soul inhering in this and that specific body. Skarige has thus reconstructed Averroes' doctrine, and he does it precisely because he takes this doctrine to be a backdrop of Cardano's theory of intellect. Look at the passage number six. In newer on the soul, you followed the madness of Averroes and Tenestius before you, and made the soul mortal. The intellect, on the other hand, is one primary thing, filling everything and introducing itself to every single entity. Each of these entities admits the introduction of the intellect to the degree it is able, and possesses it for the sake of defending its life. This is just like a certain incorporeal sun, which does not rise or fall for anything, but always and everywhere is present to everything. Mm -hmm. Like Aphelois, Cardan posits one universal intellect. Each human being, on the other hand, has her own soul, which is individuated in the body and hence destined to dissipate with it. Scalia here observes that Caldam has derived his notion of the mortal soul from Avelis, but elsewhere he associates it with Alexander, as is seen in the passage number seven. Therefore, what you brought forth from the work of Alexander into your own soul really deviates from philosophy. Namely, the material intellect is certain preparation in the soul. This preparation is apt to receive all intelligible species. So, if it is a preparation, it would be an accident. The material intellect here means our individual soul, and in Scaliger's view, Caldera follows Alexander in conceiving it as a certain material disposition, and hence an accident which is to vanish with its substrate. As we have seen so far, Scaliger considers Cardano's doctrine of intellect to be based on Alexander's and Averroes' interpretation of Aristotle. But this is not the end of the story. Scaliger argues that the reliance on Averroes has inevitably led Cardano to join the camp that is quite opposite to the school of Aristotle. Look at the passage number eight. The universal human intellect would in no way be different from the Platonic ideas. Each of these ideas is one something, and communicable to every individual. The earliest known inventor of this doctrine of the universal human intellect was Tenestius. Alexander, however, also seems to claim the same thing, but Averroes nurtured it. Plato characterized his ideas as something universal, shared by individual entities, an assumption which was severely criticized by Aristotle. Nonetheless, Averroes and Cardan have inherited this assumption and, of all things, presented it as Aristotelian. Scalier opposes this belief, as is seen in the passage number nine. Do you dare to argue stubbornly that these silly things come from Aristotle's opinion? If so, how can Aristotle refute Plato's doctrine of ideas? His objection is directed nothing but to the claim that idea is something singular and at once separate, because the same thing cannot be outside singulars and in singulars, or separable or unconjoined. If Aristotle shared this your doctrine, he would suffer from the same problem, with his intellect being one, communicable, and separable. Scaliger here observes that those who posit something universal, uh, no, Scaliger further observes that those who posit something universal as agent intellect have 
have not attained any consensus about its identity, a fact indicative of the absurdity of their fundamental assumption of the universal intellect. Look at the passage number 10. Some said that the agent intellect is an intelligence which is diffused and almost scatters itself. Others said that it is a world soul which carries out its duty just like a servant. Avelois, in his paraphrase of metaphysics, said that it is the last of the celestial rulers. Some, really rashly, wanted that it was God himself. What is noteworthy in this passage is the second sentence, where Scaliger refers to the philosophers who identify the universal intellect with the world soul. We should here recall that Caldano supposes the world soul as a power diffused throughout the universe, a supposition that Scaliger severely criticizes in the Exeritat Romans. What has irritated Scaliger most is that Caldano sometimes identifies this, this scattered soul with heat, presumably on the basis of abilities. This identification is, in Scaliger's opinion, utterly materialistic, excluding whatever incorporeal from this world. Given this criticism, it is probable that in the passage just quoted, Scaliger counts Caldano among the second group of philosophers. By doing so, he may try to reveal the true and dangerous implication of Caldano's theory. Despite his usage of the term like intellect and the word soul, which apparently suggests something incorporeal, what Caldano actually understands by these terms is nothing but all pervading heat. In this vision, what Caldano speaks in his theory of the intellect would be a disguised expression of his pernicious materialism. Let us then proceed to look at how Scalier articulates his own position in contradistinction to Caldano's. As we have seen, Scaliger understands that Caldano's doctrine has two salient aspects. One is its postulation of the universal intellect. The other is its assumption of the material and hence modern soul. Scaliger targets these two points. He criticizes the notion of material soul as being unable to explain why the soul does perform a number of activities that can never be reduced to the material four elements. As for the supposition of the universal intellect, Caldano contends that our individual soul alone can bring forth intellection without any external help. Instead of single universal active principle, Scaliger supposes multiple human souls, which recognized recognizes both singulars and universals autonomously. Look at the passage number 11, which well summarizes this question. It is fitting that because of its dignity, the soul carries out its own duties and exercises its powers without any protection or support from any accident or anything inherent in itself. Rather, the soul does these things immediately through its essence, without any mediator. Its essence has no real distinction in terms of its powers, being the self-sufficient principle. It is being sufficient in itself for producing its effects. These effects are not only simple and uniform, but also composite, diverse, and perfect. This can be possible because of the simplicity and the divinity but these effects are derived one after another in order. Scaliger thus excluded any naturalistic and materialistic implication of this conception of the soul. The soul is a simple divine being. To conclude, my account has shown that Scaliger's criticism of Caldano was rooted in his own toxographical vision. 
he observed in Cardano's doctrine of interact a confluence of at least three philosophical strands, which were represented by Alexander, Avelis, and Plato. Cardano marshaled these authoritative figures so as to present his dangerous naturalism as of Aristotelian provenance, a move that Scalia found really intolerable. In, contradi in contradistinction to it, therefore, Scalia emphatically contends that the world consisted, contained no universally diffused principle. Instead, it consisted of multiple and autonomous souls and forms. The controversy over the intellect thus provided Scully with a good platform on which to articulate his notion of divine forms and souls, a notion which was to become the, con the, co the uh, cause of yet another series of controversies in subsequent decades. Let me close my talk with one more tentative, very tentative remark. Scalier's exposition might give us a clue to reconsider Averroes' place in the history of philosophy. In the past, historians studying the Latin tradition took Averroes foremost as a proponent of the Eunisticism. This rather narrowly uh, focused perception was one of many legacies that I think Thomas Aquinas bequeathed to the modern historiography of philosophy. Aquinas very much concentrated on refuting that doctrine, and his concentration had long conditioned the understanding of, of Averroes. However, after Harry Wolfson's and Charles Schumit's groundbreaking articles in the 1960s and in the 70s, scholars began to advocate the necessity of having a broader perspective in approaching Averroes, a perspective well adapted by Craig Martin's recent book on Renaissance Aristotelianism, Hirohira's latest talk on Bernardino Telesio, and Adam Takashi's forthcoming dissertation on Alberta Glade. Conquering with these studies, I would argue that the holistic approach to Averroes is also necessary precisely in order to understand the doctrine of the universal intellect. According to Scalier's diagnosis, the doctrine constituted an integral part of Cardano's world picture, where the universal intellect was not only involved with the epistemological process in human beings, but indeed activated the whole range of natural phenomena, as it was sometimes identified with heat. Scaliger considered that Cardano here expanded the role of the intellect beyond what Averroes had originally argued for. But on this point, Scaliger's judgment may not capture the reality, since the allegedly expanded role of intellect with its intimate association with heat was already stipulated by Averroes himself. In his earlier treatises, Notably, in his commentary on the generation of animals, Averroes considered the active intellect to be the source of a special type of heat which brought animal souls into actuality. Only in the later and more matured treatises, such as the long commentary on the animal, he limited the function of the universal intellect to the epistemolo epistemological dimension. Note here that such a chronological <coughs> developmental understanding of Averroes' philosophy is a product of modern scholarship. Premodern intellectuals instead perceived his corpus as a synthetic whole. This was particularly the case after the end of the 15th <coughs> century, a period which saw a remarkable increase of the availability of Averroes' entire corpus. In sum, Cardano did not need to expand the role of the intellect. What he wanted was already in Averroes. This Averroes was an amalgamation of different phases of his ideas, and hence displayed far less coherence and far weaker <coughs> naturalism than those we usually associate with his philosophy. With his philosophy. 
that it is precisely this heterogeneity that maximum, maximized the interpretative potential of the corpus as a whole. Without restoring this holistic vision, we would never clearly see the real place of Avelis and Unistis Caesars in the history of philosophy. Thank you.